Good morning, everybody. This is the Mac Road Church of Christ. Sunday Acts study, starting at Acts 27, 9. Pray that the Lord is blessing you and keeping you. Remember that as we're looking at this, we're noticing that Paul is on what some people call his fourth missionary journey. You remember that he started in Jerusalem where he was arrested. He ended up in Caesarea for a number of years. Then he appealed to Caesar, and now he's on this boat journey as we're taking him through here and through this area here. And we're gonna, uh, we, we found out that Paul uh, was transferred to an uh, Alexandrian ship here in Acts 27 and verse 6. And we're, so we're right in this section here where it deals with Paul on this journey and about to go into this, this um, uh, Eurocletus or this storm. And we're going to see Paul in this storm here. So this is, where we're, this is where we're at right here. He's on this journey here. Between here and here is where he's at. And we're in Acts chapter uh, 27 and verse 9 is actually where we're at. So let me go ahead and read some of this for you so that you can get it. Remember that I'm using my E sword up here so that you can see it. Now, I'm going to go ahead and start in verse uh, 4 because uh, it's kind of a, a paragraph or a breaking point. A point. It says, from there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the, the wind was contrary. And so I'm going to be referring to this chart over here that we have. So as he talks about that, he's sailing uh, uh, under, let me go back up here and make sure something real quick. Um, he's sailing under, um, sorry, the shelter of Cyprus. And I just wanted to make sure I had the right name on that. And so he's sailing over here under Cyprus. And so here's Cyprus. And so rather than going this way, which would be a nice fast route right through the middle of the Mediterranean Sea because of the weather and because of the condition, they skirted the coastline, you might say, and they went along here uh, because that's where they would find um, a more favorable winds as the winds would circulate through here and would push them then over this way, which is which, where they want to go. So they're, they're going to uh, end up here in uh, Lycia or uh, Myra. And then we're gonna, they're going to go over here to uh, uh, Snidus, and that's where, that's where we're going to find them here. So let's take a look at this as we, as we read this. And it says, because uh, the wind was contrary to us, and we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. So they landed there at Myra in Lycia. And remember that the weather's getting bad. And so that's the reason they're skirting the, the coastline, because they would really like to go right pretty much through the middle of the, of the sea and get there in a few days rather than co going along the coastline and taking longer. And it says, and there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and, and uh, he put us aboard. So here they had just changed ships and they're now on an Alexandrian ship. Now uh, Rome had a, had a uh, contract with uh, the uh, Alexandria for the purpose of shipping wheat and uh, food commodities. And so they, apparently they found one of these ships that was going up to Italy in order to deliver some of the, some of the wheat or some of the grain that uh, had been contracted by Rome. It's kind of like in the United States, uh, we have a big wheat belt in the center of our country. And a lot of our wheat is ship, shipped to other places uh, in order to uh, be sold. And so that's, that's this Alexandrian ship they got on verse seven says, when he had sailed slowly for a good many days and with difficulty had arrived at Snidus, since the wind did not permit us to go any further, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off of uh, Sal Salmon. Now that's talking about this area right here where we're, where we're looking here. And so it says that they sailed around here and they, they sailed to uh, Snidus. So again, notice they're hugging the coast and he says it, the wind was contrary. It was very difficult sailing uh, as they were sailing along uh, in this ship. Remember that they were sail ships back then, uh, and therefore they had to be at the mercy of the wind. And usually they could tack back and forth if they were going like against the wind, but it had to be a, a pretty much a gentle wind or, a, or a, not a storm. In a storm, they, it's very difficult for them to do much of anything, which is what they're going to be encountering as we go along. And so uh, we notice that it, he then says, uh, and he put us on it. And so it, it says, when we had sailed slowly for, for a good many days. So, there, so it, it 
tells you how how long it took them. And you didn't take many days to make that trip. If I remember right, I think it took about two days normally to make it. And they had to do it in many days. And with difficulty, they arrived off Snidus. So they arrived off Snidus. And since the wind did not permit us to go any further, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off uh, Salmon. So as they're going along, they, they came to, to here. And so because the wind was against them, they set sail down this way through here. They would have much rather gone through here, but as you can see, there's a lot more water there. And the more water you have at this time, the more difficult it is to sail uh, because of the storms. And so if they uh, hug close to land, it makes it a little bit easier. Now, what I want you to understand is that that Paul, uh, that, that Paul um, understood that it was difficult times and that uh, there was going to be some difficulty as they were sailing. Now it says in, in verse nine, when considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous, uh, since even the, the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them. And he said to the men, I perceive that the, that the voyage will certainly be with danger and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there, if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing southward and northward and spend the winter there. So as, as uh, the voyage is going, it says in verse nine that it, it, it was uh, now extremely dangerous. It says when considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous since, since the fast was already over, this fast would be the, the Passover where they were supposed to fast uh, at, during the Passover, and that's what he's talking about when he talks about the fast. It's pretty much like a, a known holiday of the of the nation, and everybody knows about it, even though everybody might not celebrate it. It's kind of like a Thanksgiving in America or the Fourth of July. Everybody knows about it, but not everybody necessarily keeps it. Uh, and so, when uh, uh, it's just telling us the the kind of time, so it would, it would put them it would put them sometime around. Uh, can't remember exactly the, the date of that, but it would put, let's see if I can find it here real quick. Um, it doesn't really say here uh, in Clark's, let's see if Clark says it. Uh, see, it's the great day of atonement. And so it's the seventh month, uh, which answers to late September. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. So it's around, it's around uh, the end of September, uh, the beginning of October. And so the weather gets pretty bad in the sea. Uh, and, and any open bodies of water. <clears throat> and so it, it says that, that the voyage was now dangerous because the past was already, fast was already over. In other words, it's, it's not really the time when pe people are gonna be um, uh, going on ships and the, the sh shipping um, uh, industry kind of uh, slows down during that time. Uh, and only local cargo is carried, you know, from, from uh, one, uh, port to another real close to land, and you, you don't have extensive traveling during this time because it's extremely dangerous. And it says, and Paul began to admonish them, uh, and to admonish means to warn them. Now, notice what it says in verse 10. And he said to them, men, I perceive that this voyage will certainly be with danger and great loss. What's, what's uh, uh, not only of the, of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives, uh, but also of our lives. Uh, now, I want you to, if you know the story, you know that nobody died. And so somebody might say, well, see, Paul wasn't very inspired if he didn't know that people were going to die. But what I want you to notice is this word perceive. What's interesting is when you look at this word in the Greek, it's, a, it's actually the, the word that we get our word theory from. And it, sim it simply means right here, it simply means to... Uh, be a spectator of or to discern. In other words, what it's saying is Paul is saying, I think I'm theorizing. Paul isn't saying I'm giving you an inspired message. He will give them an inspired message a little bit later. But right now, he's just a spectator looking and he's viewing and he's, sur and he's uh, uh, surveying the events and perceiving what he thinks is going to be a difficult journey for them. Now, uh, you have to remember that Paul 
uh, by this time had already been in a number of shipwrecks. Uh, he, he, so he was pretty, pretty used to traveling and he understood the dangers. And so therefore, just from his own perspective, he says, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and, and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Now, one of the things that this shows us is that generally speaking, <coughs> excuse me, when you have a, a big ship and there's a storm and difficulty at sea, generally speaking, somebody's gonna lose their life. Uh, one of the hands will be washed over in, in, you know, in the storm if the ship happens to make it or uh, the ship itself might, might sink and people will die. And, and so there's, there's, especially if you're out in the middle of the open sea, and it's not like we have today rescue ships that come out and save you or you can call somebody and they'll come out and try to take care of you if you're having trouble, you're on your own out there. <clears throat> and so um, Paul understands that because of the weather and because of the difficulty of the wind and because of the, the time of the year, that, he's, that they're in great danger. And so he tries to persuade them. And by the way, I'd suggest to you, that's what we try to do with people too. We try to persuade them according to what we perceive and what we understand. And so therefore, if we know that there's danger coming, we certainly care about the people around us <clears throat> and we don't want them to get into trouble. And so we, we uh, tell them what we know or we tell them what we, what we understand so they can make a good decision about it. And that's something that, that, we need to, that we need to understand. If you know something, if you're an expert or, or have experience in some area and uh, you know that somebody's going to have difficulty, you need to tell them. Uh, you need to be concerned about them. You need to love them enough rather than allowing them to go through the, the danger and the circumstances they're going to go through uh, as if you don't care because we're God's people and we care about them. He says not only of the cargo, but also the ships and of our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by, uh, than by what was being said by Paul. Now, uh, I want you to notice that you have this word persuade here. Um, and the, the, the centurion, who is probably paying the majority of this trip uh, uh, from, the, from the Roman coffers, because he's got a bunch of prisoners that are being delivered over, and so the, the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain. So certainly the pilot and the captain would have more experience than Paul because this was their line of work. So apparently the centurion listened to them um, and, and rather than to Paul. And he says, or it says in, in verse 11, but the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what Paul said, or than what was being said by Paul, because... Now, here's the reason why the pilot, I mean, the centurion was more willing to listen to uh, the captain and the pilot. Now, remember that the centurion could take his people off the ship there while they were at port and, and just, you know, they could just wait. But he was persuaded by the, by the uh, captain and by the pilot. And here's why, because the harbor was not suitable for wintering and the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they could re reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southward and northward and spend the winter there. And so they, they were planning to, to try to go to Phoenix, which was right there. Here's where they were. They're right here and they're, they're trying to make this decision. And the reason that they're making this decision is, he, is as the centurion is trying to consider whether he wants to stay on the ship or not, uh, he, they're told that, that the ship itself can't stay there because this port is not suitable for a big ship. And by the way, this was a fairly big ship. It had over three, about 300 people on it, plus the cargo and the, and the tackle and the food and everything else that would be included. So it, it's not a small ship. It's a fairly big ship. And uh, big ships don't, can't all stay in every little harbor uh, because uh, when the winter comes, it's going to batter them. Um, uh, and so therefore, the captain said, it's better for us if we can go over here to Phoenix right here. Now, this, this harbor was, was bigger and better suited for ships to winter in. And so they could stay a couple of months there while winter passed. And then they could travel on their journey back up here to Italy. And so that's what, that's what they were planning. And so they wanted to come over to Crete. And that's the reason why the captain or the centurion was persuaded by 
the captain and by the pilot. Now, one of the things this shows us is that persuasion or being pers or, or uh, uh, being convinced has to do with the evidence that's given to you. It's also true when it comes to being persuaded by God. Uh, God can, op can open a person's uh, heart, just like here. These individuals, the, the centurion, was listening to do two different perspectives. One of them he was going to follow. The other one he wasn't. And so he weighed the, the considerations. He considered who was saying it, the pilot and the captain, who were, who were seamen. He was looking at the, at the uh, uh, usual evidence, which was uh, the place where they were at now wasn't suitable for wintering. And not only that, but the majority of them wanted to go ahead and press on and go to Phoenix. And Phoenix wasn't that far away, and it would de definitely be a, be a better place to winter. There was probably more resources there. And so the idea was they could, they could reach it and stay there and be more comfortable. Uh, and uh, it was a harbor of Crete, and it was facing southward and northward uh, as opposed to where they were now, which was not suitable for wintering. So they were planning on wintering. They weren't planning on continuing their trip. They were just looking for a place to stop. And, and so that's where, it's, that's where we find them. Now, verse 13 says, when a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete close in shore. But before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called uh, Euroclio. And when the ship was, was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. <clears throat> Running under the shelter of a small island called uh, Clauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After they had hoisted it up, they uh, used supporting cables in undergirding the ship and fearing that they might run aground on the uh, shallows of uh, Sirtis, they, they let down the sea anchor and in this way, let themselves be driven along. Now I wanna, wanna stop here and take a look at some of, the, some of the stuff that's going on here. <clears throat> because one of the things that this shows us is that uh, even though Luke wasn't a sailor, that all the things that he was saying were pretty accurate about what was going on. And not, not only that, but it also shows us that, that the, the history and the geography of, uh, of uh, the Bible is pretty accurate. And, uh, and therefore, it, it points to the verification that it is, it is inspired by God. And so notice that it says, when a moderate south wind came up, came uh, up, supposing that they had attained their purposes, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete close inshore. So what happens is that uh, here they are, and, and, and they're right here. And so a south wind comes. In other words, the, the wind is blowing this way, and it's a gentle south wind. So it's blowing this way from here. Now they're going that way, but as they're going that way, if they have a wind that goes this way, they can set their sails at an angle and that even though the wind is coming this way and they're going that way, uh, they can use the wind to push them. If they set the angle like about this angle here, if the wind is pushing down on them uh, uh, from the south or is coming southward and they angle their sails kind of uh, 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 northwesterly, that the angle of the of the wind will push the ship along. It won't push it real fast, but it but it will push it, and they'll be able to make it over here to, to Phoenix, which is which is what they're trying to do. And so that they, they thought as they got this gentle south wind blowing, that they would be able to make it. So they decided to set sail. But what we're going to notice is that it says that after a, a little bit, the wind changed, and they then were facing into the wind. And, and in other words as they were going, this wind from up here, that turbulence here would, would circle like this uh, along there in the winter. And when the wind circled this way, rather than them having a wind blowing, blowing sideways against them, they would be going directly into the wind. And it's very difficult uh, for them to tack back and forth when the wind is coming directly into them uh, and, it, it, and makes it real difficult. And so that's, that's what they're talking about 
as they're talking about this. Not only that, uh, but it, it says over here uh, that they settled on Crete, verse 14, but before very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind called uh, your Rocklios. And it says, and when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way uh, to it and let ourselves be driven along. So the, uh, like I said, once Euroclido came and it was actually facing them or heading in, or it was coming exactly the way they, they were going, but, but hitting them in the opposite direction. So it was, it was pushing them away from where they were trying to go. Uh, the ship was caught in it. And so the, they gave way to, to it uh, and let ourselves be driven along. So rather than trying to fight it, they just went ahead and went along with the wind, hoping that it would, that it would stop or that it would slow down so that they could then get their, their um, uh, compass back and be able to navigate to where they were going. It says in verse 16, running under the shelter of a small island called Clouda, we were uh, uh, scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. And so they, they came to this little island and it, it, it's such a, a small little island that it really doesn't even show it on here uh, where, where, this, uh, where this island was. Uh, and so, but, but coming under the island, the reason they come under the island is because it protects them from the wind. And even with that island, that small little island, it was very difficult for them to get control of the ship. <clears throat> and, and it says, in verse, 20, verse 17, and after they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables in undergirding the ship and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of uh, Sirtis, they let down the sea anchor uh, and in this way, let themselves be driven along. Now, uh, this, this shallows of Sirtis was kind of like a, a, a uh, underground or uh, under the ocean shoals. In other words, it was a place where, where the, the sand would be deposited and it would, wouldn't be very deep. And so what happens is, is that if a ship gets close to it, it gets stuck. And once it gets stuck in there and the wind pounds on it, that ship is going to definitely break and, and uh, you know, people will lose their life or, or whatever. And, and so those, those were pretty, pretty uh, um, well known and documented, uh, documented uh, sailors uh, problems. Uh, and so they knew that there was going to be problems if they hit those. And so rather than them uh, go there, they decided to let down the sea anchors and in this way, let themselves be, be driven along. Now, the, 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 the sea anchor uh, is not uh, like the regular anchor that you and I think of that, you know, is a hook and it grabs onto the ground because in a storm, you don't want your boat to be tied down uh, to, to, by a rope because what will happen is the the um, uh, constant pulling of the of the rope will will either you know break your break your line and your anchor will will uh, you'll lose your anchor or uh, it will break up the ship as the as there's no place for the boat to to drift to or to go up and down it, it you know because when it because when the waves come the boat goes up and down but if the anchor's tied down to the bottom then it's going to secure you and you're going to have a difficult time. And so all, all of these are, are nautical uh, activities that are going on. And the sea anchors, uh, they basically had two kinds of sea anchors. And one of the sea anchors was that they would tie like a big rock onto the anchor and they would throw it out and it would basically drag along the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the um, uh, shore or the bottom of the, of the ground and, and uh, it, it would drag them so that at least that way the ship could could move, uh, but it wouldn't move too far. Uh, the other kind of sea anchors they had were basically like what you and I would call hang gliders, or, or you know, uh, kind of like kites that they would toss into the water and it would open up and it would be like a, a big canopy. And so as the ship is moving, that canopy would keep it from from moving uh, very very much. And so they put out sea anchors and let themselves be driven uh, because you, you at least don't want to get caught in the shoals or the shallows uh, of uh, Sirtis or else you're really going to be in trouble. Now, verse 18 says, in the next day, 
as we were being violently storm tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. Now, if you start to jettison the cargo, then it's it really, uh, really are having a difficult time. And notice that this is many days. And so that, that not only did they have the, the difficulty when they first uh, came uh, along Crete, uh, but now they're, they're spending many days out in this violent storm-tossed storm -tossed ocean. Uh, and so now they, they're getting so desperate that they jettison the cargo uh, that they have. Now, the cargo is probably not uh, referring to the uh, wheat or the uh, commodities that they're carrying. It, it probably refers to anything that was just loose or anything that they could throw overboard that would lighten the ship. So probably like people's luggage, people's uh, stuff that they had brought on board from, you know, if they, if they were moving from one place to another. Uh, and so all of that stuff would be thrown overboard. Uh, the, the owner of the ship wouldn't want his, his uh, commodities to be thrown over it, except as a last resort, uh, because that's his money. That that's how he's going to get paid. But as far as the the cargo of the people and what they brought, that that you know they'd much rather lose their cargo than they than they would their lives. And so that's what they're throwing thrown overboard. And then it says and on the third day after they threw the ship's tackle uh, overboard with their own hands. And so then uh, three days later after they jettison their personal cargo, then they jettison the ship's tackle. And the only time you would ever jettison the ship's tackle is when you, you're at a last resort. Could you use the tackle in order to maneuver the ship? And so they, they threw the, the, the heavy tackle that was used for the ship and they threw it over with their own hands. In other words, it, it wasn't something that happened by accident. It was intended because apparently they realized that they were at the end of their ropes. And remember, it's been, it's been a while since they've been at sea and they've been tossed by the storm. So it's not just like a, a day or a two day storm. They've been, at, they've, they've been in the storm for a couple of weeks already. Uh, and, and so it's, it's very difficult for them. And so you have to kind of understand that. Uh, that might explain why Paul, uh, even though he wasn't inspired, says that, that you know, we're probably gonna lose the ship and we're probably gonna lose some people and the cargo uh, before they left, but the centurion was more persuaded by the more experienced pilot and the captain uh, than he was by Paul. And so, uh, but, but Paul apparently uh, in his experiences at sea was uh, somebody who kind of had a good idea of what was gonna happen. And so on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, so now this is many days after the three days after which they threw, they threw over their cargo. So it's, it's been a while. And it says, since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small storm was assailing us, from then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. And so uh, the idea of neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, if, if you're a sailor, you know that you want to be able to see the sun and you wanna be able to see the stars, not just for the giving of light, but so that you can know where you're at, so that you could navigate, because that's how they navigated in, uh, during the, uh, those times. And they still navigate uh, by the stars today. Uh, some people still use that method to navigate by the stars uh, and by the sun. You know, the, the sun rises in the, in the east and sets in the west. And so if you're if you, if you can at least see the sun, then you know whether you're going east or west or north or south. But they, didn't, they couldn't see the sun. They couldn't see the stars. They had no way of knowing where, where they were. And they had thrown out the tackle. They had thrown out their cargo. Uh, and so they were pretty much all lost. Uh, they all lost hope. And it's interesting that, that it's when we're at our wit's end, when we're at, in our storms of life, when we've done everything that we could possibly do to try to rescue ourselves and we lose hope, that's when God shows up. And so just think about that here in this storm. Now in verse 21, it says, when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incur this, this damage or loss. So now Paul says, I told you so. <laughs> 
So, so uh, uh, Paul also wasn't uh, uh, wasn't necessarily um, uh, very kind to them, you might say, but he was chastising them and telling them that you know they followed the, they followed the wrong advice, and certainly that happens with us. We we often follow the wrong advice, and when we do, it leads to trouble. Uh, and when God doesn't specifically tell us stuff, uh, sometimes it causes us to have to follow other people's advice, and sometimes it doesn't work out so well. Uh, but uh, Paul points out that they should have followed his, his they should have followed his advice, and not have sailed to incur this damage or loss. Now, verse twenty two says, "Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of the Lord, to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood before me, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You." must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all of these who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. Now, I want to stop there for for just a minute, and I want you to want to notice a couple of things here uh, in this reading. Uh, First of all, he urged them, he reminded them that you should have listened to me, and uh, I'd suggest to you that generally speaking, uh, if if you have the choice of listening to a Christian or listening to just someone who's in it for the money or profit, which is one of the main motivations for the pilot and the captain, they were in it for profit. They were that they were trying to, uh, uh, you know, make a living at this and and get their money from it. So so they're their judgments were a little skewed by their ability to make money. Uh, But if you have a a Christian and somebody who's just in it to make money, and they both have experience at the at the same um, event or, or for the same activity, it might be wise to listen to the Christian whose perspective is coming not from a, what am I going to get out of it? Um, perspective, but from a what's best for everybody perspective. Uh, and so I'd suggest to you that that's one of the things that, that Paul is teaching us. Now, Christians aren't always right in everything they do, but your chances are probably better if you can take advice from a Christian rather than somebody who's out in the world. Uh, and, and so uh, Paul had told them that. Now, the other thing is, uh, remember I told you that Paul had perceived that there would be a loss of life? That's because he was theorizing through his own knowledge. But now, Paul says, for this very night, an angel has appeared to me. Or I'm I'm sorry, in verse 22, it says, yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will will be no loss of life among you. Now, notice that Paul doesn't say, I perceive there'll be no loss of life. Paul says there won't be any loss of life. And, And why is that, that Paul says there won't be any loss of life? Did Paul's perspective all of a sudden change? Did he get more more knowledge or, you know, how did he know? And the answer is, is the way that we know everything that God ever speaks to us. And that is that God revealed it to him. In verse 23, it says, for this very night, an angel of the, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me. So Paul says that, that he had a vision and that God sent an angel. And, and the angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. And so here in, in verse 24, it tells us what the angel said. He said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Now, up to this time, I guarantee you that Paul was afraid or, or had some fear of losing his life even if it was just simply because of, of the own unknown circumstances of whether, you know, he would make it or he wouldn't make it, uh, he certainly uh, would be in a position of being, uh, of being understood why he might be afraid. And certainly all the people that are with Paul, they're afraid, but the angel says, do not be afraid. And that is because once God tells us something, we don't have to be afraid of the unknown. We don't have to be afraid of what's going to happen because God has told us what's going to happen. And when God tells you what's going to happen, you can be sure of it. And so the angel says, don't be afraid, Paul. 
you must stand before Caesar. So God says to Paul, Paul, I told you you're going to stand before Caesar. And I have, and what God's saying is that I really haven't changed my mind. And not only that, and behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. Now, notice that it says that God has granted, granted uh, you. Now, the idea of granted you seems to imply that Paul had been praying for not only himself, but also for all the people in the ship. Because God granted, apparently, Paul's request. Uh, it, it doesn't just say God decided that they're, that they're going to be saved, but he granted it to, to Paul. So the idea of granting it seems to imply the idea of a request. And so Paul had been praying for all the people in the ship. He'd been praying for everybody who's in danger. And we should learn something from that as Christians. We're not just supposed to be concerned about ourselves. We're supposed to be concerned about everybody. And so therefore, in our prayer life, we should, we should be praying for those who uh, are in our sphere of influence or for the world. Uh, and, and we should be praying for them that God would grant them life, that God would, would not take their life, but God would grant them the ability to, of course, be saved. Uh, but not only that, but just to live so, so that they can come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, and so it seems that Paul had been praying for everybody in the ship. And it says that God granted you all those who are sailing with you. So uh, God allowed Paul's request. And uh, God said that none of them were going to be lost. All of them were going to be saved. Now, that's what the angel said. Now, verse 25, therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. Now, notice in this verse that he now turns his attention to the people and tells them, after telling them what the angel told him, he says, be of courage, men. In other words, uh, 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 you should, you should uh, realize that that now we have something to fight for, uh, because you are going to make it. You you are going to be alive. So so be of courage, men, for I believe God, and, and that it will turn out exactly like uh, exactly as I have been told. Now, Paul says, "Believe God." Now, uh, whether they believe God or not, it's going to turn out exactly the way that it that it's uh, that God says. But if they if they don't believe God. You know, one of them could, if they decide, commit suicide and cast themselves over the ship and, and, and be killed or, or die if they wanted to. But Paul says, believe God. Believe what God says. Believe that it'll be okay. Believe that you can make it. You know, that's really, that's really what we need to understand. Well, many times we're going through problems. We're going through difficulties. And we don't think we're going to be able to make it. We don't think we're going to, that, that God is, is around. Or we don't think that God loves us or we think we're never going to get out of it. But God says that if you're one of his people, he's going to take care of you. We need to believe that. We need to believe ex exactly what God says, no matter what's happening in my life. And Paul is going through this storm, and so are all these people, and they need to believe. Now, here's another thing. You as a Christian, and me as a Christian, we need to demonstrate our belief. We need to hold to our belief in God. And that means that when other people are panicking, we're not. When other people are, are protesting and when other people are destroying property to get their way, we're trusting God that he's in control and that he knows what's happening and he knows what's best for us and he will provide and take care of us. Uh, and, and so ra rather than us getting excited and rather than us doing things that we shouldn't do to try to take matters into our own hands, we need to, to be examples of individuals who are doing what is right, not of individuals who are simply following a mob or individuals who, when they don't get their own way, um, uh, uh, react in a way contrary to what is good for people and good for individuals. Remember, for the Christian, God is the one who takes care of us, and he promises to do that, but we have to believe it. If the Christian loses, loses hope, then what do the other people have to, have to hold on to? But if the Christian stands firm and is a, a voice of reason in the midst of uncertainty, 
then other people will be comforted. And so that's what Paul is doing. He's telling them, believe God. I believe God. I believe it's going to, I believe it's going to happen exactly the way he says it's going to happen. I believe it. You might not, but I do. Uh, and, and Paul can then be an encouragement to them in the midst of a storm. And by the way, that's generally when, when we need that kind of encouragement. In, in Philippians chapter, uh, one and, and down here at verse um, right here he says in, in Philippians 127 only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel so that whether I come and see you or remain absent I may hear of you you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And then, and then also in, in Philippians chapter 2, he says down here in verse 12, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed in my presence, not only in my presence, but, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working, who is at work in you, both to will and to work his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory, because I, I did not run in vain nor toll in vain. Notice that he says, don't grumble. Don't dispute so that you will so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. You see, we're supposed to be different than the world. So we're supposed to act different. We're supposed to respond different than than the way the world does. And so Paul says, be of, be of courage. I believe God. I believe it's going to happen. I believe exactly what he said. The Lord appeared to me and told me that. Now, then let's see what happens. Verse 26, but we must run aground on a certain island, but when the four, 14th night came, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be uh, 20 fan, uh, phantoms, and a little further on, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. But as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes uh, of the ship's boat and let it fall down. Uh, and let it fall down until the day was about to dawn. Paul encouraged them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having, nothing, having taken nothing. Now, I want to stop there, and I want to come up here and look at what's going on here. And so, uh, Paul told them that they were all going to live, but the ship was going to be destroyed. The cargo was going to be lost. They were going to lose everything except their lives, remember. Uh, and certainly, uh, that's a lesson for us today. We today are going to lose our, our physical life, all of us. And everything you own, everything is going to be lost to you. Your house, your cars, your boats, your, your trailers, your business, your, your whatever it is that you think you have, you're going to lose it. It's, go it's, going to be, it's going to be gone. It's going to be lost. And the only thing you're going to come through this world with is your life. And if you face the judgment and you're not part of God's family, then you're going to end up losing your life as well. But if you're in the family of God, then you're going to lose everything except your life, and God will grant you and bless you with everything that you need 
once we leave this life, he will give us everything, everything else that we need. But the ship was going to be lost. The cargo was going to be lost. Everything was going to be lost except for the, the people. God granted them their life. And if you have your life, then you have everything because you can start all over again. And, and so it says, but we must run aground on a certain island. So, so Paul pointed out that the angel told them or that God was talking to them, him, and that they were going to end up running aground on a certain island. Now, when, when a big ship like that runs aground, it's going to break up. And so Paul is kind of predicting for them through, through prophecy that the ship is going to, to you know, run aground and be broken up. And that's how, it's going to, that's how the ship is going to be lost. And, and everything is going to, you know, going to be destroyed. But, it, but when they run aground, they're going to run aground on a certain island, which gives them the hope that at least there's an island close enough for them to swim to when the boat breaks up. Now, verse 27, but when the 14th night came, uh, as we were being driven about in, in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. So <clears throat> this is 14 days. Now, I don't know if this is 14 days from the time Paul told them uh, that they were going to be uh, saved, or <clears throat> if this is 14 days from the, you know, a total of when they when they ended up being in the storm, but either way, th that means they're they've been in the storm for two weeks at least, and maybe longer, that they've been fighting this, and so uh, you know they're, they're in this ship, and so people don't eat very much. They're worried about their lives, and the, the ship's rocking up and down violently, and so no doubt some people's tummies weren't the greatest, uh, and so it says. Uh, that uh, at midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. So the sailors who, who, who were more sea knowledgeable, uh, no doubt perceived that they were approaching land. And you might say, well, how did they perceive that? Well, as you get close to land, the sound of the waves changes uh, because in the ocean, they, you don't really have the sound of waves. You have the motion of waves. You don't really have the sound of waves. But as you get closer to land, then you start getting the curls on the waves and you start, ma start making noise. And so apparently the sailors could, could hear that. And as they heard that sound, they then perceived that they were approaching some land somewhere. Uh, and so it says that they took soundings. Now soundings uh, means that they take a rope and, and they put a weight on it and they drop it from the ship. And uh, every so often, uh, it has a mark on on the rope that tells that that's a certain length. I believe they're they're phantom, uh, and, and therefore uh, there's there's twenty, uh, and therefore the uh, phantoms uh, are are about. Uh, let me see. It's, this says they're forty yards. Uh, twenty fat fathoms is about forty yards. So yeah, so every phantom is about six feet. Um, that's what I was trying to remember. So the, the f uh, fathom is about six feet. So there's 20 fathoms. So, so that's about 40 yards deep is how, you are, how they would be. But the rope has a, 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 every, every six feet, it has a little knot or a little mark. And so as they drop it, they would count the marks until it hits bottom and they would know how far from shore they are. So they took found, uh, uh, soundings and they found it to be uh, 20 fathoms, which is about 40 yards. And then they took a little bit more. Uh, they waited a little bit. And remember, this is midnight. So they took another sounding and it's 15 fathoms. So that means that the ground is coming up at a pretty fast rate because uh, th there's a 30 foot difference in just a little way. So they knew that they were coming close to some, some uh, uh, island or the shore. Uh, and so they, they didn't want the ship to run aground uh, at, at this time. And so it says in verse 29, in fearing that we might run aground uh, somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. So they cast four anchors. Now these anchors actually held them in place. Uh, and so maybe the storm had settled down a little bit, but they knew that if they just let the ship keep going towards the shore, which is the direction they were going in, that it, it would get stuck and, and it would be in the middle of the night and they wouldn't be able to see 
uh, you know, which way to swim or where to go. So at least they were hoping to find day, to reach daybreak or to last until daybreak when they could see the shore and be able to figure out which way to, to go uh, if they had to jump in the water. And so they, they were hoping for daybreak. But remember, the sounding took place at midnight. So it's early, early morning. Now, verse 30 says, but as the soldiers were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors for the, from the bow, Paul said, now, I want you to notice, people of the world are more concerned about their own well-being and their own safety and their own security than they are about other people. The sailors were... Uh, put down their little, you, you and I would call it a little lifeboat, but it's their, it's, their, it's their secondary little ship that they would use to go out and, and, you know, and if they were in port, for example, they would use it to shuttle people back and forth, or uh, the sailors would use it to go out and, and, and uh, do, do stuff to the ship or, or weigh anchors or whatever it is that they needed to do. They, they, had, a, they had a small ship, that wasn't a ship, sorry. They had a small boat that, that they would either pull or would be on would be on the you know tied to the edge of the of the ship so that they could lower it down, and so the sailors, uh, since they they were sailors, they had a pretty good idea of which way to go, and so they all got in this little ship in this little boat, thinking you know telling the people well we're going to go put out some more anchors, but their intention was really to go out and leave, and, and Paul knew that Paul Paul understood that. Uh, apparently the, the Lord told him or, or an angel told him, but he, he knew what, what they were doing, or maybe he heard them. Maybe he heard them saying what they were going to do, uh, but uh, they were going to escape on the pretense of laying anchors. Verse 31, but Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. Now, I just want you to notice this. He says, unless these men remain in the ship, you, you yourselves cannot be saved. So, the, so the, the soldiers uh, or the centurion and the soldiers uh, had to now make a decision. Are we actually going to believe Paul that, you know, we can't let these men go and escape? Or uh, are we going are, are to let them go ahead and escape? At least, at least they'll be saved. And so they had to make a decision about it. And, and it shows you their faith in the words that Paul told them, or, or that they were now persuaded by Paul, and were willing to listen to Paul, uh, and no doubt part of the reason they're listening to Paul is because all through Paul's imprisonment, he's, he's been uh, an honest, upright individual, he's been a good example of what a Christian is supposed to be, and uh, he certainly is right when it comes to the idea of them just coming on to a uh, island and going aground and the ship being broken up. And so this, the soldiers, the centurion, uh, or Paul tells them that unless these men stay in the ship, they can't, can't be saved. Because God didn't say just some were going to be saved. God said all of them are going to be saved. And so it says, then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the, of the ship's boat and let it fall away. And so the, the, the only other way for them to be able to be saved for any of them to be saved was to, to cut their ship away. So now there's no way for them to be, to be delivered except through the help of God. Uh, and that's what God often does with us. He lets us get to the very end of our ropes where there's nothing more we can do to find out whether we're going to trust him or not and to believe in him. So it says, then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Now, verse uh, 33. Uh, uh, until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, have, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your uh, preservation, for not a hair from your he head of any of you will perish." Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were, were 276 persons. When, when they had eaten enough, 
they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat uh, into the sea. And so uh, it, it says here that the soldiers cut away the, the ropes in verse 20, 32, and that they were now waiting for day. And as day was approaching, or as, as Paul knew what was going to happen, he said, today is the 14th day that you've been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. So Paul said, you've been fasting for 14 days, uh, but you're going to need some strength now. Verse 34 says, therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your pr uh, preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. And so Paul is, Paul is telling them, look, you're going to need some strength. You're going to need some, you're going to need some, some muscle. You're going to, you know, so make sure that you eat because you're going to be thrown into the ocean. You're going to have to do a little swimming. And if you, if you, if you exhausted and don't have any nourishment, then you're going to die. One of the things that this tells us is that even though God is the one who says he's going to deliver them, God expects them to do their part. God expects them to do what they can do uh, for them to fast and, and be on the verge of death. Uh, and expect God to just deliver them because God said he would and them not have any, any part in it is not the way God works. Uh, God always has a part for us to do. God always has something that we're supposed to, to do uh, to put our faith in him. And so the idea of them taking food uh, is also them putting their faith in God. Because what it says is, okay, we are going to be shipwrecked, but we are going to live. So therefore, I better eat something so that I can handle what, whatever God is going to put me through in order for me to live. And so God has always, and God always does, require something of us. There, there's always something that God requires of us when God is helping us and, in, and, and encouraging us. We're never supposed to just sit down and do nothing. We always do our part. And so Paul tells them that they need to eat. And he says, for not a hair for, uh, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Now, th that's a figure of speech. Uh, I don't personally believe that some of them did not lose a hair because it's natural for us to lose hairs as, you know, just every day. Uh, it's amazing how many hairs fall off my head uh, whenever I comb my hair that I find in the sink. And so it's just a natural thing for us to lose hair. But, but the, this expression isn't really speaking about hair. It's speaking about the idea that God is going to preserve you. He's going to, he's going to keep you alive. Uh, and that's the expression. Uh, now, certainly if God didn't want them to lose a single hair during this time, he could have done that. But I'm, I'm not really persuaded that that's what he's talking about. It's just, the, it's just a figure of speech that says God is going, to, is going to allow you to live in the condition in which you are at the time he says that. And in other words, that you know, you're not going to lose your arm. You're not going to lose your, a big toe. You're not going to you know, something like that. It, you, you're not going to live crippled, uh, but you're going to, you're going to be the way you are. And so he's telling them that they're going to, they're going to live without any problems, you know, without any major difficulties. Not, none of them are going to be impaled by something and they're going to, you know, lose a lung or, or something like that. Uh, that happens in, a lot of times in shipwrecks. Uh, and so in verse 35, he says, having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God. Now here you have Paul, taking bread, and uh, no doubt this bread is old bread, but nonetheless, he gives thanks to God. We need to give thanks to God for everything and for every situation. You, you might be thinking, what a time to give thanks to God, but that's actually when we need to give thanks to God. Because when we give thanks to God, thanks is an expression of our gratitude for what God has done for us. When you don't thank God, th then you think that the things you're going through, God has no idea what's happening. God, God has no idea what you're going through, and so therefore, why in the world should I thank God for anything that happens to me during this time? But that's the very opposite of what we ought to do. We ought to give thanks to God. If you're going through difficulty and you can breathe, give thanks, give thanks to God for your breath. If you can move, if you can walk, if you can, uh, whatever it is that you can do, constantly give thanks to God, even if you're going through difficult times and problems. Uh, make sure that you are doing what you're supposed to do. So we need to make sure and do our part uh, in the things. And, and we need to give thanks for, for everything that God does for us. Uh, and so Paul gives thanks, and he gives thanks in the presence of all. Now, we're not supposed to be uh, uh, showy or to do things to be seen by people, 
but also we don't not do things because people are seeing us. We do what we do as Christians, whether somebody sees it or not, but our motivation is not to be seen by people. But no doubt as he gives, th as he gives thanks in the presence of all, th they certainly are also thinking about this God who's going to deliver them. Uh, and so it says, and he broke bread and he began to eat. So Paul uh, did what every good Christian should do, and that is that apparently he went first. He started eating so that other people would eat and, and be encouraged to take food so that they could live. Now, verse 36, and all of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. So as they saw Paul eating, uh, they began to eat, and they were encouraged by the words of Paul. Remember, as God's people, you and I encourage people by our activity and by what we do and what we say. And if we don't say anything or we don't do anything for people in relationship to God, then how in the world can they be encouraged? They'll just think we're just nice people and we're kind people, but it has nothing to do with our relationship with God. But it needs to be hooked into our relationship with God. That's what makes us different than the world. And we're going to be gracious and kind and caring even when other people aren't. Verse 37 says, all of us in the ship were 276 persons. So it was a large ship. It wasn't a little bitty boat. It was, it was a large ship. And it says, and when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. And so the, the, the owner of the ship even apparently understood that he was going to go ahead and lose his, his income. In other words, he's going to have to make it up somehow. He was going to lose his income. Uh, and so therefore, they decided to throw even the wheat, the the the. the commodities that they were carrying to Rome, he was going to dump that because he knew he was going to lose it anyway because Paul said he was. And they wanted the ship as light as possible because that way the ship could go further inland without hitting bottom and th they would be a lot closer to, to shore when it came to them having to swim if the ship is lighter and therefore its draft isn't very deep. And since its draft isn't deep, it could get closer to shore and that way when they uh, all have to swim uh, to shore, it won't be as far of a, of a journey or as far of a swim uh, as if uh, they kept all that weight in the ship. So they threw all the ship's cargo all over and they threw everything out and they understood that they were going to uh, run aground and the ship was going to be broken up, but they were all going to be saved and spared. Now, here's what's interesting. They don't know how they, exactly that was going to happen. They don't know whether you know, uh, they would find another boat there that would bring them ashore. They don't, they don't know. They don't know anything about how it's going to happen, except for the fact that God says it's going to happen. And that's what you and I need to understand. We might not know all the details that God has planned in our life, but God says he's going to take care of us. And God says he's going to bless us. And so what we need to do is we need to be faithful to him, not faithful to some religion, not faithful to some traditions, faithful to him faithful to God and, and serving God and, and being the kind of example that God wants us to be even when other people aren't. And so uh, I hope that in this, in this adventure, we see God in it because very, very few times that a ship is, is wrecked or that a ship runs aground or is everybody saved or is everybody uh, brought to safety. It's very rare when that happens. <clears throat> and therefore, one of the things that this shows us is that God is the one who's watching out for us during the storms of our life. Well, I pray that God blesses you. I pray that you have learned something from what we have been sharing with you and pray God uses you in his service.